The events in this program are based on a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, a broken in debt financial planner whose wife is cheating on him hatches a plot to fix his life if he can just find the right hitman. <laughs> Houston, Texas, 2010. This is Ron Martin, an out-of-work financial planner, and his wife, Jane, a part-time nurse. They've been married for 10 years, have fallen out of love, and have no children. Ron is eating breakfast and watching internet porn. Jane believes Ron is rich, so she's been cheating on him with a doctor at work for over a year, hoping Ron will divorce her and she'll get a settlement. She takes an Oxycontin as she gets ready for work. So obviously, this is not a healthy relationship, but there's something else. Ron has a secret. He invested heavily in video stores, and the genius lost his tail. Now he's got to find a way out. Jane left her phone in the kitchen, and it buzzes. It's a text from Dr. Kevin Lee, Jane's lover, confirming a plan to meet her at a hotel after work. He gets an idea. Ron goes into the bathroom to hand Jane the phone and tells her they're about to take out a new investment, a very, very big life insurance policy. So here's a free life hack. If your spouse puts a large life insurance policy on you with them as the sole beneficiary, sleep with one eye open. The next day, Jane signs the policy. In just 24 hours, Ron has gone from bankrupt cuckold to brazen criminal. Back at home, Ron turns on private browsing and searches for info on leave no trace murders. Ron is proving to be a very dumb criminal, but he thinks he's brilliant because all dumb criminals think they're brilliant. Here's the thing. Take it from an FBI agent. There is no such thing as private internet browsing. While searching for the perfect murder, Ron has a brilliant idea. He will hire someone else to do it. So the criminal genius puts an online ad out for a hitman. Hitmen are hard to find because the good ones aren't gonna answer your ads. The bad ones are already in prison and doing 25 years to life. So what Ron is looking for is the dime a dozen guys who claim to be hitmen but really aren't. Ron finds a few good candidates advertising their services on a dangerous jobs posting. So he writes, Hi, I saw your post about killing somebody for an insurance payout. Love to learn more. But it's okay, because he is on private browsing. He emails them to set up a series of interviews on Saturday. He's hosting a hitman job fair. So where else would you meet a hitman you met online to kill your wife? In a seedy bar. Ron meets the potential candidates. We have lots of years. Lots and lots of years one after another. Some have potential. Others have too little experience. I'm the man you need, whatever you need done, however you need it done, I can do it. I mean, whatever you need, I can do it quietly, messy, I mean, you tell me. But one sticks out for his enthusiasm and bargain rate, Carl Belt. So here he's got the cheapest guy on the internet, what could go wrong? Ron gives Carl a photo of his wife, Jane Martin, and a picture of her car. He tells Carl about Jane's daily activities, where she works, when she leaves the house, and asks Carl to take care of this before the weekend.
Though he doesn't have experience as a hitman, Carl does have a small criminal record and has served jail time for aggravated assault. So he thinks aggravated assault is what, like halfway to murder? That's in my resume, I can do this. Carl settles in with a beer and researches online the best way to kill someone. The more blood you leave, the more evidence you leave. So he's in a conundrum. And Carl's got a problem. He gets squeamish around blood. This is a poor trait for a hitman. After reading various how-to websites, Carl decides that he will ambush Jane and strangle her to death. Strangling involves no weapons other than a rope, and if done properly, it can be very clean. You can learn to do anything online, anything. But if you do, you leave breadcrumbs, and the FBI will know what you learned. With his plan in place, Carl searches for more information on Jane Martin and finds her profile on social media. He looks through a few pictures to study the face of his next, well, first victim. The next morning, Jane Martin leaves for work at the hospital. On the way, she posts on social media that she's going to pick up some groceries and asks if anyone needs anything at the hospital. People share everything on social media. Hi, I'm stepping off this curb. I'm at this coffee shop. This is fabulous for stalkers. You might as well have strapped a GPS to your body. Meanwhile, Carl has barely slept and is stalking Jane online. He sees her post and realizes this is his chance to take care of business. Carl is thinking, being a hitman is the easiest thing in the world. All you have to do is show up and kill someone. Oh, Carl, you don't have a clue. Carl approaches the grocery store and spots Jane's car in the parking lot. He waits till she goes inside, then exits his vehicle and approaches hers and tries to see if the door is unlocked so he can hide in the back seat. But the door is locked. He is momentarily at a loss for what to do. Carl hides behind Jane's car and waits. Jane Martin is now on her way back outside with her groceries and a box of donuts. Jane unlocks her door, and while she is putting the donuts in the car, Carl ambushes her. Carl uses a rope and a technique he's learned from watching strangling video tutorials online. Jane puts up little fight, and her life is lost. Carl has moved Jane Martin into the passenger seat. They take off. Carl then makes a call to Ron to inform him the job is finished. Well, hey dude, I killed your girl. You sure? Ron is delighted and sighs with relief. He says the insurance money will take a few weeks to arrive, but he will reach out to Carl to settle up when it does. Ron decides to celebrate and heads out that afternoon to get some happy hour drinks with friends. He has more than one too many, and no one knows he is secretly celebrating his wife's murder. When he gets home, he notices the lights are on and the door is unlocked. Someone is there. He smells something cooking and cautiously heads to the kitchen, where he is greeted by what should be his dead wife, Jane. So say you're Ron. That's when you go back in your short-term memory and think, what did I drink? Ron Martin has discovered his wife of 10 years, Jane, has been cheating on him with a doctor at the hospital where she works as a nurse. Ron decides he's going to murder Jane, but he's not going to do it himself. Ron hires Carl Belt, who kills Jane Martin. But after a night of drinking and secretly celebrating her death, Ron gets home and can't believe what he sees. Jane is still very much alive and making a delicious pot roast. Hey, honey. He says hello to her, 
then exits the room and immediately calls Carl. Hello? What the hell did you do? You killed the wrong woman! What do you mean I killed the wrong person? Can't believe what Ron is saying. And Ron sure sounds drunk. Yes, I'm drunk. You're an idiot. You know when your boss said, hey, you screwed up this job and it was embarrassing and you were sweating it out? Imagine how Carl's feeling right at that moment. He's told that you didn't kill my wife and he's remembering, yeah, i pretty much sure I did. And so now you don't know whether you're dreaming or whether Ron's trying to rip you off. You have no idea what to think. And Ron is sitting there saying, what, what's going on? And then dinner served. <sighs> In order to prove his point, Ron snaps a selfie of them and sends it to Carl. What? No, get off of me. He sends it to Carl. Carl's got to be thinking to himself, I killed somebody. If it wasn't Jane Martin, who did I just kill? Carl looks at the photo and something doesn't seem right. He pulls up Jane Martin's social media profile. Multiple Jane Martins come up. Carl compares the profile of the Jane Martin he killed with another Jane Martin. Oh my God. He is stunned at how closely they resemble one another. They have the same car? And nearly oh faints. So Carl has killed the wrong Jane Martin. I mean, yes, there are two Jane Martins in Houston, and yes, they looked alike. Carl even did his homework, but he did it poorly. As if this case couldn't get more bizarre, it does. You see, the now deceased Jane Martin turns out to be an awesome human being. She works in a hospital, she never misses a day of work, she brings donuts into work, everybody loves her, and Carl has killed her for no reason. But in an ironic twist, Carl could be home free at this point because he had no motive to kill this Jane. So the police have nothing to go on. They don't even know where to start. You don't put in your mind an accidental killing. He's home free if he walks away at that point. What's so hard about this kind of case is that police trace motive, they trace means, they trace connections, and there's no connection. There's no motive in this case to kill that particular woman. Even if it's insanity, there's indications of it at the crime scene. This has nothing. Carl is home free if he just keeps his head down and never does anything wrong again. Jane Martin and Ron's wife looked a lot alike, but their personalities could not have been farther apart. Ron's wife, Jane, was kind of unpopular. The men liked her, the woman didn't. She talked down to people, she came off as arrogant. She was just nobody's favorite. Yeah. Her co-workers also knew that even though she was married, she was having an affair with Dr. Lee. And she would also talk trash on her husband. She said that he was a deadbeat and that he had no sex drive. The surviving Jane Martin was also known to have recently fired a nursing intern, Keith Marshall, by blaming her own sloppy and misfiled paperwork on him. You're fired today. Get your stuff and get out! One day after she cooks dinner for her husband and finds him acting strangely, she finishes up work, puts away some things in her desk drawer, and inside finds a note that says, death to you. Jane is terrified at the discovery of the message. She tries to reach her love, doctor, but he doesn't answer. Did you leave this note in my desk? This is not funny. So she frantically calls her husband, Ron, and leaves a message about someone trying to kill her. You need to call me as soon as you can. Ron Martin discovered that the hitman he hired to murder his wife, Jane Martin, made a bizarre and lethal mistake and killed the wrong woman named Jane Martin. You got the wrong woman. The hitman, Carl Belt, now realizes what he has done and is determined to kill the right Jane Martin to get his insurance payout. 
Meanwhile, the real target, Jane Martin, is alive but fearful after receiving a death threat at her office. Jane frantically leaves her husband, Ron, a message that says she's going to leave work early because she's terrified. She makes a post on social media that she got a note that someone is trying to kill her. Carl sees the post and leaves for work. And this time, Carl is not going to waste his opportunity to kill the right Jane Martin. Jane is walking to her car, but this time, Carl has planned things well in advance. Carl is hiding behind the stairs near the parking lot. He sees that the Jane Martin he is about to kill drives the same model of car as the Jane Martin he already killed. When Jane turns her back on him, Carl rushes out behind her and starts choking her with the same rope. He pushes Jane into the passenger seat where she goes out of consciousness. Two wrongs never make a right. An experienced hitman would never try to make good on this crime. And if they did, they wouldn't do it in the exact same way at the exact same place. And most importantly, they wouldn't rush it. Carl steps into the driver's seat and takes off. While in the car, Jane wakes up. She realizes she's been kidnapped, but she pretends to be dead. Carl is driving erratically. Jane pocket dials 911 on her phone. An operator answers and hears what's going on. Carl glances over and realizes Jane is still alive. She tries to fight him off. The first murder went so quickly, Carl just assumed the second one would too. But this is no plain Jane, and she is fighting back. But Carl eventually wins. Carl then decides it would be the smartest thing to take the body to the exact same place he took the first body. Carl believes that at the end of this rainbow is a pot of gold. He chose the wrong rainbow. At the end of the one he's following is a prison shower. He's thinking, what can go wrong? He's like an ant doing the same thing over and over by rote, but he's doing the wrong thing. So it's the next day and police now have two suspects. The first is the ex-intern Keith. Now Keith has admitted to the police that he left a death threat in Jane's desk drawer. I can explain that. Yeah, that's creepy. Yeah, that's horrible. But it's not a conviction because he has a solid alibi. And that alibi is corroborated by everyone who works with him. All right. Thank you. The next suspect is the logical one, Jane's spouse, Ron Martin. Now, police have already learned from her coworkers that she was having an affair. That's motive. Then they found out that just days before Jane's murder, Ron took out a large insurance policy on her life with him as the sole beneficiary. So what you've got now is motive, proof of motive, but you're lacking one important thing, they don't have physical evidence to connect Ron Martin with his wife's murder. But the police have another mystery to figure out. Two Jane Martins dead within just several days of each other. Is there a serial killer out there? Somebody who hates the name Jane Martin? Investigators look into any phone records, texts, or digital footprints that may have been left before the murder and discover one new number in particular that shows up frequently in Ron's phone the week before the murder. That number belongs to Carl Belt. Hello? So they bring in Carl for questioning, and they find that he's not the savviest criminal they've ever interviewed. Big surprise. They also go through his digital records and find out that he has pulled up the social media pages of the first Jane Martin who was killed. If there was a Hall of Fame for dumb criminals, Carl just earned his way in on the first vote. With all the pieces fitting into the puzzle, investigators are left with only one question from this killer. Why in the world would he leave the body of his second victim in the same place as the first? When a novice hitman kills the wrong person because she has the exact same name as his intended victim, he tries to make good on his promise. 
but he decided to carry out the crime in exactly the same manner and leaves a long trail of clues that led authorities right to him. My grandmother would be smart. Yeah. So let's think about Carl's mindset at this moment. He's killed the first person and seemingly got away with it, except for the fact that he killed the wrong person. It was perfect. So now he's killing the second person and he says, I'm going to dump the body at the exact same place. That way the police will never bother me. What can go wrong? Carl gets life in prison without parole. Ron gets life in prison for orchestrating the hit. And remember Keith, the ex-intern? He gets his job back at the hospital because apparently they were short one nurse. Just when you think you've seen everything, here comes this bizarre case of mistaken identity. You have two women with the same name, same cars, they even look alike. And then you roll in a vengeful husband and Carl Belt, and what do you get? So what have we learned? One, murder's never the answer. And two, even though everything you read in the internet is true, you still shouldn't believe what you read about a hitman. The case of the murder of Jane Martin and the murder of Jane Martin reminds me of something that we used to say in the squad bay. The Riddler is fiction. He's a made up character. We were rarely stunned by the brilliance of criminals. We were more often astounded at how foolish they were. The thing about this case that rocks me to the core, like all other cases like this, is how casual people are with the lives of people who've lived 30 years and have 40 more to go. How can you be so callous?